I, I'm in love with my degree. Hey, welcome back to my channel. It's Emma, and I thought since the last kind of video I did of this uh, was super popular and people really liked it, and I thought it was just so fun to show like what's on people's university syllabi or college kind of uh, coursework and such. So um, I thought today I would film what I have to read for my second semester of university being an English major and a classical studies major. As you might have noticed, um, I did kind of rearrange my setup a little bit. Not really. I am debating whether I should keep this little 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 bitty bookshelf over there but um i think for right now this is how i'm gonna keep it so if you like it tell me so just for a little bit of introduction if you don't know i am in english and classical studies so this semester at university i am taking two english courses and three classical studies courses but other than that my courses or i think modules is what the british would call them um we have british literature <laughs> And then we also have Women in Literature, which is a special topic course called Women Across Borders, dealing with issues that obviously cross the borders of countries or some kind of limit or border that has been set up. Uh, in terms of classical studies, I am taking Greek art and archaeology, Greek and Roman sexuality, and Greek epic. So I'm really, really excited. This is definitely a classical heavy semester, but I just, I really love it. I, even though English is kind of my specialization and and, uh, classical studies is just a major it's just quickly become so I love it so much like these two shelves on my bookshelf are all classical studies works um, and very quickly there's no more room so yeah also just for some more context I am in my third year of university and um, I'm not gonna show like every single little thing I have to read just because that would be way too much. I just thought like what I could physically show you, I would. Um, but again, if you do want like a very huge comprehensive list or of things we have to do, feel free to message me. I always love like just encouraging or just talking to people in general about English or classical studies because I think it gets such kind of a, there's such like a misconception about it as well. But more than that, I just wanna say as well, I feel like studying for an English degree is like getting a degree not getting a degree and everything but you just get to like dip your feet in such a variety of worlds and subjects um, it's kind of like getting a history degree not obviously but it just deals so much with history and time and even science we study so much science in English and just people and concepts and literally English is just so inclusive that I feel like it just just studying English it's more than like writing and technicality which like we never focus on honestly it's more just like the subject viewpoint if that makes sense of a whole bunch of different people and worlds and places and um faculties and yeah so I just thought I would say that but without further ado let us get into the novels and books I'm going to have to slug my way through all right, so we're going to start off with my woman in literature class, and one of the novels we're going to have to read is called Nervous Conditions by Sitsi Degaremga. I think I said that right. So this book is called Nervous Conditions because I believe it just like kind of tries to map the nervousness and the anxiety that comes with kind of post-colonialism. We are following Tambu, who is a girl living in uh, post-colonial Rhodesia, and she basically thinks that her way to freedom and her way to empowerment and to kind of get through with this women's movement is through education. Um, however, the kind of only education available to her is the white man's education. Uh, so she learns to speak English, she learns to kind of uh, behave like them, and just all these terrible things that obviously this very kind of narrow-minded uh, learning would encapsulate. More than that, I've read that this book is definitely about kind of bringing to the table women's rights when it comes to decolonization and how women need to play and should play a key role in that. Um, and once again, I think it's dealing with this border image between Rhodesia and obviously the States or Canada or whatever boundaries you want to put on this kind of Americanization of culture. Um, so I think it's going to be really hard to read. The books and poetry that we've studied so far in this class have been so heavy and so real and so 
oh, they've been so weighty, but like it's just so important to put yourself through that because there are actual people going through stuff like that and even just to read about it, if that makes you feel a fraction of what um, basically was poured into the reality of these books, then I think that's super valuable and super important. So Nervous Conditions is the first book that uh, we're going to be reading in my Women in Literature class. So the next book for my Women in Literature class is called A Small Place by Jamaica Kincaid. This one also deals with kind of the colonization of the Caribbean. While this does appear to be a book, it is actually just a huge expansive essay that's kind of detailing uh, the small island where our author grew up. I believe St. John's Antigua is the place. And it says that she makes palpable the impact of European colonization and tourism. The book is a missive to the traveler, whether American or European, who wants to escape the banality and corruption of some large place. Um, so this has to deal a lot too with kind of the invasion and the kind of taking over of tourism of all these islands that obviously don't belong to the tourists. I do have to do a presentation on this poem that has to do with tourism in the Caribbean and how kind of people are just taking it over and upheaving the land from the people who actually live there to make a profit out of making other people go there who don't live there basically, which is awful and that's always something to keep in mind I think when like you plan a vacation as well like there's always that kind of guilt that like you're going to this place that is now more catered to you than it is shaped to the people who live there um so i think that's what this book is about or this essay is about as well so that is a small place this next guy is obviously for my greek epic class but it is the iliad by the Homeric tradition. I'm currently reading this. I'm currently on book three and I got the Lattimore translation, which is the one we have to use for class. And I have read the Iliad before. This is a reread for me, but I've never read this particular translation. And guys, it is so much better than the other one I read. So if you do plan to pick up the Iliad or you want to, I would really recommend the one by Richmond Lattimore. Um, subsequently, if you don't know what the Iliad- <sighs> I forgot. I forgot. I forgot we were having fire alarm testing. Beautiful. But like I was saying, if you don't know what the Iliad is about, we are following the war between the Trojans and the Greeks because obviously uh, the Trojan, Paris, he has come over in what was supposed to be kind of a nice little gathering and party amongst the Greeks and he has stolen Helen because Aphrodite has promised him the most beautiful girl in the world because he totally told Aphrodite that she was the most beautiful goddess. So obviously the Greeks and Helen's husband Menelaus are not super thrilled about this so they go to war led by kind of the leader of the Greeks but by no means the king I think that's a, like kind of the thing that people have they always think that Agamemnon is the king of the Greeks but he's not he's just a dude who has the biggest army um, led by Agamemnon and they set sail for Troy um, and it takes them 10 whole years before they actually even kind of get close to the city. This book is set in the 10th year because there was prophecy that it would take them 10 years to besiege Troy. So uh, this book contains obviously all the heroes, Nestor, Achilles, Ajax, Hector, everyone like that. There's so many little events that go on in here um, and it's just so interesting to read. It's actually quite exciting, quite accessible as well. So don't be scared about that if you had ever had doubts about picking it up. Um, the Iliad and the Odyssey are probably some of my favorite books ever. I think they're a lot of people's favorite stories um, and yeah so I'm really really loving this translation and this this reread and yeah so that is the first one we obviously have to read for my Greek epic class. This next book is for British literature and I am so incredibly excited to get into this. I feel like a lot of the time when you look at the syllabus for your English literature courses they don't have a lot of work that is particularly recent and I feel like it's because a lot of people are scared to kind of classify their contemporaries as classics um, or kind of award them the same status that people before them had awarded other books I guess but um, this is one of my favorite authors. I have very quickly just become so in love with his writing and his work and I'm beyond excited to study this. So but the book is Ghostwritten by David Mitchell. As you can see I have already read this and I have annotated it um, particularly in preparation for reading it and for maybe writing an essay about it, my final essay for this class, which I think I would really, really be honored to write on Ghostwritten. Um, if you don't know, David Mitchell is just this brilliant British author who like I can't even, I can't even describe to you what his books do. They just like, 
transcendent. Transcendent is a word I would use. But in Ghostwritten, it is quite complicated. We are following nine different people from nine different sides of the globe, and we're basically seeing how their lives connect, even though most of the time they don't know each other, they don't even know that each other exists, and how their choices and actions affect literally every single thing, even someone from like Tokyo affecting someone from Russia, affecting someone from Mongolia, affecting someone from who knows where, the states, whatever. Um, and it is so beautiful, so scary, and it just kind of weaves this web of connectivity. The study of etiology or like uh, the study of first and final causes is something that is so interesting to me and something I just like I always just gravitate towards that when I'm writing about something so Ghostwritten definitely definitely encapsulates that because obviously the title suggests that we're not writing our own lives it's kind of this ghost or this shade that's kind of doing it for us and everything's influencing our decisions and in turn our decisions are influencing the decisions that influence our decisions <laughs> it's just like so beautiful so insane and like I've only read this book once, so I think when I get around to rereading it, I believe it's next month we start this, I I just need to pay so much more attention, and once again, it just contains so much history in it as well that like maybe you weren't aware of, or like I wasn't aware of, and yeah, Mitchell's writing is stunning. I would really, really recommend Cloud Atlas. I don't talk about this book enough. It's one of my favorite books of all time, is Cloud Atlas, and ha, ah, that book. I would really recommend. I think this is his first novel, but Cloud Atlas, I, uh, I don't want to say I enjoyed it more than this, but I think I did. So um, that is Ghostwritten. I'll just read like a little passage that I highlighted because I really, really like it. The act of memory is an act of ghostwriting. We're all ghostwriters, my boy. And it's not just our memories, our actions too. We all think we're in control of our own lives, but really they're pre-ghostwritten by forces around us. So where does that leave us? How well does the thing read? So, I don't know. I just really like that. I think it really sums up the book and <laughs> it's just, ah, so good. This next book is also my Woman in Literature course. It's a pretty famous one, so you probably heard it, but it is The Wide Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys. I actually have no idea what this book is about. I've never read it, never read the synopsis, so, um. So apparently the story takes us to Antoinette's beguiling Caribbean island, a lush and ravaged Eden ripped apart by escalating tensions between the former slaves and the Creole Harris's colonial family. Antoinette's marriage to a visiting Englishman seems to promise escape from the island's violent distress, but the lover's intense affair takes a sinister turn before the honeymoon is over. So, um, I'm quite excited to read this. I feel like this is on a lot of people's English literature modules, so um, that is that one. Obviously, this one is for my Greek epic course as well, but it is The Odyssey, which is kind of the sequel to the Iliad. Um, this one, we are following Odysseus as he is trying to make his way home to his wife, Penelope, on the rocky island of Ithaca, where he hails from. Um, however, even though the Trojan War took 10 years, it also takes this man 10 years to get back home. And along the way, you can imagine, it's kind of like a video game quest. He has to like fight all these monsters, deal with all these horrible things that happen to him. Um, and it's just really quite entertaining, I believe. When I read it, I really did like the Odyssey more than the Iliad, and I feel like when I do go back and reread it, I'll probably feel the same way, but... Um, and it really doesn't matter if you wanted to start with like the Iliad or the Honest Odyssey, honestly, it doesn't. You can start wherever you want. So. Um, I'm quite excited to get into this again as well. This next book I just finished and it broke my little heart. I cried. I am still not over it. <sighs> if every single book in my Woman in Literature course does this to me, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to be faring by the end of the semester. So this book is Can You Hear the Nightbird Call by Anita Rabadami. This book follows the borders between Canada, Pakistan, India, Punjab, uh, just everywhere. Bangladesh, like literally everything that goes on between Canada and kind of those three countries um, and all the tensions that have escalated there in the past and are doing so again pretty recently are in this book. So we are following the tragic lives of three women who are all linked by kind of these disasters and these prejudices and these religions that fight back and forth. Obviously the Hindus and the Sikhs have a very violent history and this book really, really brings that out and touches on that. Um, it was so hard to read. Um, we start in 1927 following uh, BBG who moves to Canada with her new husband and she tries to start like a new life here. 
uh, in Vancouver. And then obviously the partition happens and the British leave India and they separate uh, Punjab between Pakistan and India and that creates so many problems uh, that will come back and basically haunt these three women. The second one we're following is Leela. She is Hindu. She's from Bangalore and she also comes to Canada. And then we are following BBG's niece, Nemo, who um, is staying in New Delhi, which was obviously the site of a whole bunch of massacres of the Sikhs by the Hindus after um, the Sikhs killed the Hindu Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, if I'm getting that right. And um, then after that, obviously, this kind of led to a movement for the Sikhs to kind of create their own country within India because it was kind of taken from them by Pakistan and India, and they don't think that the Indian government is treating them very well, obviously. So much violence and atrocity and murder and... Ah, it was so hard to read. This book felt so real and, like, had so many things that I had never even known happened in the world, much less in Canada, um, leading up to the Air India Flight 182, which was basically, honestly, just a race from history, which was a flight that blew up after the Sikhs had planted a bomb on it um, off the coast of Ireland in 1985. And basically, neither Canada nor India claimed the tragedy as their own, and it was just kind of left floating in this liminal space that people just forgot about and it's never been taught in Canadian curriculum. I doubt it's taught in India and ah, this book just, yeah, I'm obviously like really just, I'm really just getting kind of fired up about it again, but like this book, I would really, really recommend this book. Um, I went in with no background knowledge, obviously. I feel like there's so much history that just like gets hidden from you or people try very hard not to let you be aware of. Um, and this book kind of just decimated those boundaries, which I loved. I gave this four stars and I'd really recommend. I've talked way too much about it now, but moving on. For British literature, we just finished looking at Yeats. We studied two poems specifically, No Second Troy and Leda and the Swan, um, which are super important apparently to Yeats' development as a writer. He Yeats is very weird. Like if you studied Yeats, him as a person, like his poetry, stunning, beautiful, love it. Him as a person, WB. It's very strange, very strange man. One of my favorite things ever, I think I've mentioned this before, is when uh, poets work in mythology, specifically Greek mythology or any other mythology or retelling or whatnot, into their poetry and Yeats does that a lot. So I really, really appreciated his poetry and um, honestly it led to really great classes and I'm just really excited to hopefully have to write about this somewhere further down the line. Next we have the most beautiful reverend dame. <laughs> I don't think she was awarded the title of Dame, but she should have been. Um, Mary Shelley. It is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and I've read this so many times now, but I'm so glad that we got to look at it again in British literature because this is just one of the best books in the world. I think a lot of people don't like Frankenstein because, or at least I, the first time I read it, I didn't really like it because I had heard so much about it and like the story had just been so mangled. It had, the story had been as mangled to me as like the monster becomes in this book. And like, I didn't, I didn't know it was kind of such a slow moving book, but like now I just appreciate it so much more. It is literally, it's like up here, top tier books. Uh, I don't think I have to say absolutely anything about this. We all know what this is about. Um, if you've never read it, I'd really recommend picking it up and just like really giving it your full attention. Um, because, oh, it deserves it. The last book I'm going to mention is actually a play that we are reading for British literature. I've also already read this, but um, this is also a play you, I need to read again and again to understand. Um, and it is Endgame and Act Without Words by Samuel Beckett. Uh, I guess really it follows these four people who are trapped inside this house where they can't stay, but they also can't leave. We don't really know what's kind of going on outside the house. Uh, some people have speculated that it's kind of just a wasteland. It's like this place where everything is just decimated. Maybe it's like a nuclear fallout kind of situation. We just don't know. But Beckett kind of just trails and goes along with the kind of comic and disastrous repetitiousness of life um, with sometimes devastating effects. It's also quite funny in some parts, but you're also kind of like, oh, that's why that's funny, and it's kind of not funny anymore. We are following the famous Ham, Clove, Neg, and Nell as they kind of go about their lives. Obviously, Neg and Nell reside in garbage bins, much like Oscar the Grinch from Sesame Street. I think that's his name, um, which is quite interesting. I don't really have a lot to say about this right now. It's been like 
two it's been like a year since i've read it so by the time we get around to it i will definitely be in need of a little refresher but that is kind of the last book that i'm gonna talk about all right those are all the kind of really palpable physical copies of books that i own to show you um just to really quickly name some more off we're looking at uh, just specific textbooks and roman and greek love poetry probably some sappho probably some uh, catalysts, I don't know. We're also looking at Alice Oswald, um, T.S. Eliot, and just so many other like poems and essays, literally so many essays. You, you, Being an English student, you don't realize how many essays you have to read along with the ones you have to write, but um, I just love it. I literally would never beg for it to stop. Like, I, I'm in love with my degree, if you can't tell, and like that is such a nice thing to say. Um, and it's such a nice thing to feel like you have to say, but, um, yeah. Anyway, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. Once again, if you want, like, more of these kind of English major, classical studies major kind of videos, let me know because, like, I just love talking about it and, like, talking to other people who are in the same faculty. And even if you're not, it's so interesting to hear about other people's faculties as well. Like, I wish I could have, I wish I had enough money and enough time to have a degree in everything. Um, but that is another matter for another video. So without further ado, I think I'm gonna sign off and uh, thank you so much for watching and for being here. Um, yeah, I hope you're having a really great day wherever you are and if not, that's okay. That's totally okay to have a bad day too. But I will see you in the next one. Ciao.